Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for December 15th, 2020. It is Tuesday, and I have already loaded up on some delicious fish tacos. They were fantastic. That also means it is Terraform Tuesday, and I'm going to be talking about Terragrunt, which is something that some viewers have asked me to talk about. They're curious how to implement it, why they should implement it, and stuff like that. So I thought I would take Terragrunt for a spin and let you know my thoughts on it and maybe show you a little bit of what I did in case you wanted to reproduce it yourself. But if you're looking for the too long, didn't watch, I would not use Terragrunt if I'm not already using it. And I'll explain why in a little bit. But before we talk about that, I do want to mention that I am updating the Terraform certification guide for the new 0.14 release. So if you're curious if my guide is keeping pace with the releases of Terraform, it is. <clears throat> And there were a bunch of new things that came out in 0.14. I don't know how much it's going to change the guide. I don't think it's going to be a ton, but there is some stuff. So I'm working through that now, and I'm hoping to get that published before the end of the month. If you didn't know I had a ter Terraform certification guide, well, now you do. And you can go out and find it on LeanPub. There is a link down in the description. Hooray! And if you sign up to be a patron at my Patreon, you'll get a discount code for that certification guide and the Vault 1 when that is finished. So... That's pretty awesome. Before we talk about Terra Grunt, let's check in. How you doing? It's Tuesday. I hope it's going well for you. And you know, if you're watching this on any other day, you can pretend it's Tuesday. You can go get some tacos or nachos or burritos. I'm not here to judge. You get the thing that makes you happy and just pretend, pretend that it is Terraform Tuesday all over again. All right, so let's talk about Terra Grunt. What is Terra Grunt? Terra Grunt was created by Gruntworks, and the idea behind it was they wanted to provide a wrapper around the Terraform executable that added some functionality that was definitely missing in Terraform at the time they chose to write this. So Gruntworks has been at this for a pretty long time, and they discovered some gaps. I mean, Terraform is certainly not a perfect product today, and it was definitely not a perfect product several years ago. There was a need, an absolute need, and I do not dispute this, for the functionality that TerraGrunt adds. However, with recent improvements and the launch of Terraform Cloud, you don't necessarily need a lot of the functionality that TerraGrunt provides. I would say if you've already moved into the world of TerraGrunt and you're using all the functionality there, then pulling yourself back out is going to take a while and maybe it's not necessary for you. However, if you're just getting started with Terraform and your organization is adopting it and you're curious whether Terragrunt makes sense for you, chances are the answer is going to be no because it's additional work that doesn't necessarily drive additional value. Now, that may sound a little harsh and I don't want it to sound that way. I think the concept is good. The product is good for what it needed to do. It just, you know, Terraform evolved. So let me talk a little bit about how Terragrunt works, or at least how I understand it, and then we can dive into an example, and I can point out some ways that Terraform has sort of evolved over time to include some of the functionality that Terragrunt initially had for it. So Terragrunt is basically, like I said, it's a wrapper. It's an executable that invokes Terraform, but it does some additional things before it does that, and all of that seems to be controlled by these teragrunt.hcl files that you'll put at different levels of directories. And the approach that they seem to take is that you're going to have a top level environment, whether it's prod or staging or QA, and your application is going to be constructed of modules that are part of this larger environment. So I've got my development environment up here, and then I break it down into my front end of my app, maybe the middle tier, and then I have the database backend. Each of those as its own Terraform configuration being used essentially as a module, and then you paste it all together with whatever is in the main.tf file in my production directory. So that's the thought. Now, typically in modern Terraform, you would just add each one as a module and then you would specify settings through variables and you would pass those variables to the modules. Those modules would give you outputs and your state would all be stored together. Now, one of the things that Tara Grunt brings up is that state management is a dicey thing 
And if you put too much of a configuration in a single state file and something goes wrong with that state file, it can be really, really bad. The other thing is if you, how do I put this? The other problem with that is when it comes to processing and planning changes, the more resources you have in a configuration, the longer it tends to take for a state or for a plan to be developed or an apply to take place. And a lot of this has to do with the way that Terraform used to do its refresh cycle for looking at what the resources are already deployed in your target environment and then comparing it to what's in your config and then planning out the changes. That is resource intensive and the bigger your configuration, the more of a problem that becomes. Terragrunt's approach appears to be rather than having one state file that has your whole config in it, instead you are going to have multiple state files, one for each, what would be a module generally, but each module is creating its own state file. It's being managed as a separate Terraform configuration. And if something goes haywire with one of those, okay, no problem. And when you need to plan out a change, it's only going to plan a change for that smaller state file. So you're making things more granular. That could be very difficult to do with Terraform as it is. And I can understand why they might take that approach, especially because of the way that Terraform used to work especially in the pre.12 days, the process for refreshing environments and the process for planning and applying took a long time. And the more resources you had, definitely the longer it would take. Now, I've definitely seen drops in that where the refresh time has dropped. And especially with dot 14, they've gotten much more aggressive on when a refresh happens, what is actually pulled during the refresh. And not only that, but also the plan is now a diff plan instead of the full plan of everything in your environment that might have a change in it. So the plan's a little more digestible. So that's a lot of recent improvements, but the way that they approach it makes sense for the way that Terraform worked back then. So let's jump over to VS Code and I've got my 2020, 12, 15 folder here. Remember you can get all these files. They're all available on GitHub in my repository. The link again is down in the description in case you're interested. I have a remote state file folder here that has a Terraform config that will set up remote state storage on Azure for you to use as a target for your staging config. Let's take a look at what's in the stage folder. And let me just kind of try to peel this apart a little bit. We've got this teragrunt.hcl file. This is the thing I was talking about. And if you have one in a parent directory, you can have subdirectories inherit the properties that are defined inside this parent directory. And in that way, you can have them inherit things that are difficult to define, stuff like remote state. So rather than defining the remote state over and over in each of these subfolders, we can define remote state here. And don't worry about these settings. I'm going to delete all of this after the recording. So <laughs> don't worry about that. But basically, you tell it, I am defining a remote state. The backend type is Azure RM. That's what I'm doing. And let me just blow this up a little bit so it's easier to see. Okay, there we go. And then you're going to have this generate value. And it says, this is telling it to generate a file. I want you to generate a file in my subdirectory. Here's the path. It's going to be called backend.tf. And if it exists, I want you to overwrite it. So if I run Terragrunt, and this file already exists. I want you to overwrite it with these new values. What are those values? Well, I want you to plop a config in there for my remote state. And here's all the values for that remote state. And it does have built in functions. So you can do things like run path relative to include, which means that it'll put the path, the parent directory path to this particular config in there. And so it won't use the same key for every, it won't use the same key for every config. That's probably the most common thing. That's the first thing I ran into when I tried to run this the first time. Another thing that you might do is you might want to have a consistent Terraform config where you define required providers pushed out to all of the child directories. So you can do that. Again, we're using this generate keyword and we're telling it what path where we want this thing generated. And we're saying we want to overwrite it. And then we're defining the contents here. And this is just a simple 
Terraform block where we set up the required providers, but you can set up other options in here. And then lastly, I'm doing the same thing, except I'm creating a provider block in all of them. And if one thing you'll know about the Azure RM provider is you have to define a provider block because you need to put this features block in here. If you don't do that, Terraform will throw an error. I don't love that about the Azure RM provider. I think it was a dumb idea to do, but here we are. So basically once I run uh, Terragrunt validate, it will validate dash all, it will go into every subdirectory and validate my various Terraform configurations. That's kind of convenient. And it will, if I run Terraform plan, it's gonna go into all of my directories and it's going to run a plan against each of those directories and return the plan results to me. So for instance, I ran those two and I've got my front end app here, we'll call it that. And you can see it's got a full complement of all the things. Now the teragrunt.htl file in here, teragrunt finds this and we're basically telling it to include whatever it finds in the parent folder. So whatever it finds in the parent folder, it wants to include that configuration as part of this. And then you can further customize the configuration of this particular deployment right here. Now, once I ran everything, it created this backend file and it lets us know this was ger generated by Terragrunt, okay. And it also created the providers file and it also created the Terraform config file. So all of that gets combined into my existing config as part of the deployment. I can see how this is pretty convenient. Now, again, the thing that I'll say is if you want to define a state a remote back end, the best way to do that is to just have the back end that you're defining very simply, and then define the rest of the back end using either environment variables or values that you pass at runtime in your CI CD pipeline. That's probably the best way to approach it. And I understand that remote, the remote state, when you're defining a back end, you can't use variables because it gets initialized before those variables are available. And that is a shortcoming of Terraform. I don't think this is the solution for it. I think the solution is to provide the values in here. You would provide none of these values. You would just leave this entire thing blank like that. And then you would provide those values at runtime, either with a text file that has all of the values in it, or you could use it with, you could do it with environment variables. I mean, either one works. So if, if you're using it for remote state, I don't know if that makes sense. The other thing that they're talking about is this way to compartmentalize state amongst all the different components of your application. And again, that made a lot of sense back when Terraform was not as good at processing changes and it took a lot longer. And also state seemed to be a bit more brittle back then. It was easier to break state. It was easier to ruin your config. Now Terraform is very good about making a backup of the state before it makes any changes. And the state file has solidified into a single format that's a little bit better and a little more scalable. So I don't necessarily think that makes a whole bunch of sense either. The last thing that they really focus on through all the Terragrunt documentation is the idea of not repeating yourself. And they give this example where they've checked in these modules to get for all the different components of your application and the teragrunt.hcl file in each subfolder, all it does is invoke what wherever that module is stored and you can specify the version. Well, the thing is, you can do that already. You can create modules today and you can publish those modules to a public repository and you can version them and you can reference them with regular old Terraform. So I think if I would summarize kind of what my thoughts on Terragrunt is, I think it's a well-written product. I think it makes sense in the context of older versions of Terraform. I think if you've invested in Terragrunt, keep using it, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're just getting started and your organization is adopting Terraform, then probably best to just stick with vanilla Terraform and avoid the Terragrunt layer on top of that because it may come back to bite you in the end. So those are my thoughts about Terragrunts. I've also gotten some requests about Terra Test, so I might take a look at that next week. We'll see what happens. But that is all I have for today. You know, if you've been enjoying these videos, I would really appreciate it if you could share and subscribe. And I also want to thank my patrons. I'm working on getting a graphic uh, somewhere in here, probably here, to thank each of you that have signed up at the mid-level up 
for uh, to, to thank you for being a patron. And don't worry, your stickers are on the way as well as your discount codes. If you want to be a patron and support this show, well, the link is down in the description and I sure appreciate it if you can afford it. If not, just keep enjoying the content. It is going to stay free. So don't worry about that. Until next time, stay healthy, stay safe out there. Bye for now.